Can't you tell by the music, bro? Can't you tell by the love you felt before you took one step through the door? And that next level teaching got us reaching higher every week. Frequent flyers speaking life despite deceased and fiber. Meant to be in cause he's inside. It's not a private party, you're invited. Come in tired, believe inspired. All generations, even cyber. Find us on the web like we some spiders. Uh, let's slow it down so you understand how it's going down. Up in here, there's one brew. Gotta love everybody that comes through. Then doors, in short. Grace is what we endorse. Faith is what we help grow. Welcome to the fam center, you know. All right, John chapter number four, verse number 46 in the New Living Translation. Faith Alive, for the next three weeks, we're going to be talking about a specific um, topic that I teach probably every two years, and it's time to bring it back around. Get your words up. Tell your neighbor, get your words up. The War of the Words, and we're going to get into part one. John chapter number four, verse number 46 in the New Living Translation. As he traveled through Galilee, he came to Cana, where he had turned the water into wine. There was a government official in nearby Capernaum whose son was not sick, but very sick. And when he heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went and begged Jesus to come to Capernaum to heal his son. He said, I need you to come with me because my son is about to die. Jesus asked, will you never believe in me unless you see miraculous signs and wonders? The official pleaded, Lord, please come now before my little boy dies. Then Jesus told him, go back home. Your son will live. And the man believed what Jesus said and started home. While the man was on his way, some of his servants met him with the news that his son was alive and well. He asked them when the boy had begun to get better. And they replied, yesterday afternoon at 1 o'clock, his fever suddenly disappeared. Then the father realized that was the very time Jesus had told him, your son will live. And he and his entire household believed in Jesus. We are discussing the war of words, the war of the words. Um, the Bible says in the book of Proverbs, chapter number 18, verse number 21, in the King James Version, that death and life are in the power of the tongue. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. The easy to read version says that death and life are produced from your conversation. And you must be willing to deal with the results of your conversation. So whatever I speak, whatever I say, it directly has impact on my life and livelihood. Now, there are some of you in this room that do not believe in the power of words. So no matter how hard we try to reiterate this message to you and relay this message to you, you downplay it. You really don't think that negative speech is impacting your life. And I'm here to tell you today that it is. So I'm going to present several things to you that many of you have never thought about. And I want you to really consider the statements that I'm making. Number one, when you share any measure of conversation that is negative, this is scientific, it is directly impacting, listen to this phrase, your molecular structure. Your body is influenced by the words that you hear. Many of you were raised being told by a very negative person, you will never be anything, you're ugly, you're worthless. And these words were embedding themselves within your cell structure to the degree that you actually started to believe that you're worthless so that when somebody told you you were beautiful, you didn't believe them because you had already been convinced by a negative influence that you were ugly. You had already believed the imagery that was placed on television and the words that were stated that this is the persona of beauty. And so when someone says to you, you're absolutely attractive, it was hard for you to receive it, not based on what they stated, but based on what you had heard prior that had already indoctrinated you to believe that you were worth nothing and you were ugly. Words are very challenging to overcome if you hear them consistently, especially at a young age. So when you have a young child and you say you bad and you ain't going to be nothing just like your daddy, that's your first indoctrination of that child. That's their first method of instruction. And that instruction sets their belief system. So now they believe as a child, I'm never going to be anything like my daddy because it's the first thing I was taught. So now, watch this, when you've been told that, someone says to you, you're going to be the president of the United States. No, my mama told me I ain't going to be nothing like my daddy. 
So I've set my bar to be like my daddy who supposedly is nothing based on what I was told. This is why the educational system makes sure to indoctrinate your children about America when they're in kindergarten. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I learned that in kindergarten. I didn't even know what a republic was. But we were told without understanding to recite this because we need you to believe our curriculum so that you will dedicate yourself to our blue collar pattern of workplace so that you will never deny the illegal things that are happening in this society and you will never embrace the wrong that is being done to you if I can convince you to love a country that doesn't necessarily love you back. It's words. It's words. This is, this is, this is words. I got to convince you that the founding fathers were good men. These are words. Many of you in this room right now have had somebody speak something over you that was so negative it broke your heart. They've said things to you that were so negative it was literally traumatizing. Can I get a witness in this room that words have impact? What is the one thing y'all constantly heard when you were kids? Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Can I get a witness that words hurt more sometimes than physical injuries? But if you have someone building you up from the time you are small and giving you a proper teaching and understanding of who you are, the impact of negative words on your life become minimal because you've already been equipped with something that has gotten in your molecular structure. Your cells have already been told you are the prettiest little girl in the world. Man, you are one of the most wonderful young men in the world. Uh, Sister Angie Witherspoon's son, Dion, when Dion was a little boy at the daycare, every day I would go to the daycare and I would say, Dion, is Dion here today? Where you at? Dion knows this. Every day, I would go to Dion and say, who's the man? He'd say, me. <laughs> Every day, to this point that when I see him, I was like, Dion, who the man? Me. Because I wanted him to believe it. So much so that when Dion was very little, he always wanted to play basketball, not with the kids that was his age. He wanted to play with the big kids because he had been indoctrinated, I'm the man. So even though y'all bigger than me, I ain't scared to play with y'all because I'm the man. This is something that we have to learn has impact on the ears of our young people. You've got to start telling them that they are going to be great in everything that they do. You've got to tell them that you are not a failure. That's why the devil is trying to confuse their sexuality when they're small. You can be whatever you want. You want to be a man, you can be a man. If you want to be a woman, you can be a woman. And when they tell them that stuff, now you've got 11 year olds telling you there is no gender. That's an indoctrination that defies science and it's all because of words. We are in a war of words. All right, now I'm about to say something very deep, Aunt Loretta, and I have never thought about this until the Lord brought this to me in prayer. Mill, we grew up hearing about a battle that took place in heaven. The battle that took place in heaven is mentioned in the book of Revelations. In the book of Revelations, chapter number 12, Verse number seven in the New Living Translation, if we have it, throw it on the screen. This is what the Bible says, and I've read this on numerous occasions, and God gave me a quick revelation concerning it and about it. If we ain't got it, I'm going to move on. Revelation chapter 12 and verse number seven in the NLT says this. Then there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels, and the dragon lost the battle, and he and his angels were forced out of heaven. This great dragon, the ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, the one deceiving the whole world, was thrown down to the earth with all of his angels. Now, everybody listen to this. There was a war fought in heaven amongst angels and Lucifer's rebellious angels. Satan was at the head of one army. Michael, the archangel, was at the head of the other one. But the Bible tells us that spirits can't die. So if spirits can't die, they can't stab each other. They can't die, they can't shoot each other. So how are they fighting? They only fight with words. Wow. All right. <laughs> the book of Jude, chapter number one. Jude, chapter number one, and verse number eight says this. 
In the same way, these people who claim authority from their dreams live immoral lives, defy authority, and scoff at supernatural beings. But even Michael, one of the mightiest of the angels, did not dare accuse the devil of blasphemy, but simply said, the Lord rebuke you. When Satan and Michael were fighting over the body of Moses, they were fighting with words because only we as human beings think that natural weapons are the most powerful. Don't run away from me. The most powerful weapons that we have are words, which is why the Bible says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Here's what people think that means. They think that means uh, prayer and fasting. That's not what it means. I'm about to help you. It's not. The book of 2 Corinthians, I don't care if you don't like it, you got to look at context. You've been saying stuff all your life. You must look at context. It is not prayer. It is not fasting. Those are not the weapons. Now, we do use those things. But in that passage, that ain't what it's talking about. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter number 10 and verse number 3 in the easy-to-read version of the Bible. We don't got no verses today. Just let me know so I can just keep reading. Okay, something's going on. Technology goes crazy. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 3, and the easy-to-read version says this. We live in this world, but we do not fight our battles in the same way the world does. All right? Weapons of our warfare are not carnal. The weapons we use are not human ones. Our weapons have power from God and can destroy the enemy's strong places. We destroy, this is your Bible, people's arguments. Paul was teaching them that the way that you fight against a demonic argument is with words. Then Paul says we use the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. When Jesus gets into a fight with Satan in the wilderness, does Jesus punch the devil? You can't punch a demon. Some of y'all, I'm going to show you devil. I'm going to show you. You punching like Trey on boys in the hood. It don't work. You use words. The greatest war that will ever be fought is in the court of law. All right, let's say it this way. You know before they launch any missiles and before they send people over there to die over stupid stuff, you know what they're doing? Talking. Old men talk and send young men to die. The war didn't start with weapons. It started with words. Jesus says in Matthew chapter number 12 and verse number 36 in the New Living Translation, and I tell you this, you must give an account on judgment day for every idle word you speak. The words you say will either acquit you or condemn you. The words you say will either acquit you or condemn you. He says you will be held accountable for every idle. That means every pointless or worthless word. So when you say something that does not have a point, or has no meaning, heaven is holding account to that because God knows how important words are, but we as human beings don't think they're that big of a deal. So we say things like, my back is killing me. Because it's become a phrase of normality when the truth is, it's an instruction. My back is killing me. You just gave a demon permission to work on your back. All right. So now, because many people are struggling with this reality, the question is then, how could the words I speak, if death and life are in the power of the tongue, how could the words I speak possibly have any impact to the degree that those words can travel? Well, we've got some scripture for you. The book of Psalm. Write them down because I don't know what's going on with our tech today, but it's not working well. Psalm 103 and verse 20. Everybody needs this in your arsenal. Psalm 103, verse 20. Bye, Aunt Linda. I love you. Psalm 103, verse 20 in the New Living Translation says this. Praise the Lord, you angels, you mighty ones, thank you, Jesus, who carry out his plans, listening for each of his commands. Now, notice what it says. The angels carry out whose plans? God's. And what are they doing? Listening for each of his commands. Yes, praise the Lord, you armies of angels who serve him and do his will. So you mean to tell me that angels are always listening? waiting on words and when they hear the words they react so if we say what God says because God's word is God's word and the New Testament says that the angels cater to the needs of the righteous 
that means that when I speak something in agreement with what God has already said, the angels are dispatched to carry out the assignment. I just read to you in Revelation that the, the devil took a third of the angels with him, which means that they have the same makeup of instruction as the other angels that are still with God. So they follow the same pattern. That's why everything in the demonic realm is just basically a reflection of what the kingdom of heaven is doing, but it's perverted. So there's an argument that the fallen angels are not demons and the demons came from the Nephilim. I don't buy it. Those are the demons. The fallen angels are now in a position where they too are listening to your words because they are bound to the degree that they cannot do more to you than you allow them to based on what you say. Y'all not ready? When Adam and Eve were in the garden, did Satan know what their weakness was? No. You know how we know he didn't know? Because he asked Eve, did God tell you there was anything you couldn't do? And then Eve said, yeah, he told us we couldn't eat from that tree in the middle of the garden or we'll surely die. And the devil said, oh, no, you won't die. In other words, I didn't know what your weakness was, but now that you told me, YPJ, I'm going to capitalize on it. Man, Lord, you know I want to serve you, but it's just something about thick women. Up, oh, every demon in hell was like, we got him. We got him now. You know, Lord, I just want to serve you, but every time Leroy called me, I just can't help myself. Now the devil knows that Leroy <laughs> is your weakness. Listen to me. Most of us are only exposed because we've given the enemy ammunition through the words that we speak. I'm sick of this marriage. I want out of it. So you've given a prophetic confession. Oh, God. And the demonic realm is sitting there waiting on an instruction. To, oh, this is good. That legalizes their movement in your life. While God's angels have been set there by God to look for you to echo what God says about you. I am the head and not the tail. Okay, we got our instructions. I am above only and not beneath. Okay, we got our instructions. Why? Because this person is only saying what God already said about them. So we have licensing now to carry out what's being stated because they're only echoing what God has already said. A lot of y'all in this room really think that your words have no impact. So you go home and you don't declare a thing. You don't speak a thing. You don't believe a thing. You only come into agreement with how you feel. Can I get a witness that each of us at one point or another has come into agreement with a negative thought that we have had? Come on, tell the truth. Don't y'all be ashamed. All of us do it. But we got to stop doing it. And sometimes, you ready for this? We got to take stuff back. <laughs> y'all still with me here? We got, man, this ain't never going to work out. Ooh. What did David say? Put a guard over my mouth, God. Shut my mouth. Sometimes you got to put your hand over your mouth. All right, I'm trying to help somebody today. Before you say something that you're going to regret, sometimes you just need to go, mmm. Because our words have impact, all right? We know that angels carry out words based on Genesis 18. The Bible says three angels came to Abram. And gave him a word. We know in the book of Luke chapter number one that Gabriel was sent to Zechariah to tell him about John the Baptist being born. We know in Matthew chapter number 28 it was an angel that announced that Jesus was being brought out of the, he had already been taken out of the grave. So angels are ministering spirits that cater to the needs of the righteous based on the words that we speak that are in alignment. And there are those that will disagree with that. That's fine. You don't have to believe it. I am telling you this stuff works. You have got to decree and you got to declare. So some people will say this to me. Well, you mean to tell me if I declare I'm a billionaire, I'll have a billion dollars tomorrow. That's not how this works. What happens is when you make a confession of faith, there's, a, there's several things that need to, to come into factor here, right? <laughs> First confession of faith that I make is I'm going to be a multimillionaire. The confession is wonderful. Now God is going to begin to line you up on a path to get you to the destination. Your job is to walk that path, which means it could require you to go back to school. It got quiet in here. 
See, because y'all want genie blessings. God gives out process blessings. I, I'm believing God for a wife by this time next year. Okay, that's cute, but that means he's about to put you through a whole lot of trials. Because you're not ready to get married, and he's got to get all that stuff out of you since you believe God can do it by this time next year. Get ready to go through some stuff. Feel like I ain't never got no money. God said, get used to it. Because every time you get paid, she's going to take that money. Y'all ain't saying nothing. You got to get Man, my friends, I can't never hang out with my friends. Get used to it. There are certain sacrifices that you have to accept come along with the declaration that you've made. I just said something so good right there. I declare in Jesus' name by this time next year, I'm going to be completely healthy and I'm not going to have to take no insulin. I'm not going to have to take no pills. I ain't going to have to take no shots. And the Lord says, I will make it happen for you. Yes, through million. He's going to put you on a treadmill. He's going to put you on some dumbbells. He's going to put you on an elliptical machine, a stair machine. And then I'm going to change your diet and you're going to have to stop eating pork. I don't want to do that. I knew that wasn't going to work. No, 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 no. It works. You won't. It works. You won't. Because faith without works is Y'all know the Bible, so you can't just say something and then get mad and be like, I said it and it didn't come to pass. Some things take time. Would you encourage your neighbor and say, some things take time. Some things take time. All right. We know that God carries out blessings and miraculous feats. The Bible says in the book of Matthew, chapter number 15 and verse number 28, that there was a woman who was asking the Lord to heal her daughter of a demonic possession. Jesus believes that this woman has great faith based on her demonstration he says, wait a minute, your faith is so great, I've never seen this kind of faith amongst those who should have faith. So that lets us know that you ain't got to be in church to get a miracle. You know, there are people that don't ever come to church but got more faith than some of y'all that's been sitting in here for 20 years. That woman said, look, I don't know nothing about none of that. All I know is my daughter is grievously vexed with a devil. Can you heal her? Jesus says, your daughter is whole right now. Now listen to me, y'all. Jesus said, your daughter is whole right now. How is her daughter whole right now when her daughter is demon-possessed and didn't ask for deliverance? Because y'all thought in order for people to be delivered, they had to want it. That's why you won't pray for your kids. I can't want more for them than they want for themselves. In some areas of life, yes, but when you're dealing with devils, devils don't have a right to be here. So you have a right to cast the demon out without your children's permission. I feel the Holy Ghost. You got to know what you're dealing with. Jesus said your daughter's whole in this very moment because of your faith. So then how did the demon remove itself if Jesus was not in the same proximity of the woman that needed the miracle? For the angels, through his word, carry out his assignment. So whatever that demon was doing, that demon was over there tap dancing, having a good time in that young lady's body. An angel showed up and said, hey, hey, huh? Jesus said you got to leave. You did? Yeah. Dang it. And the demon left. Which brings us to our key text. In the book of John, chapter number 4, verse number 46, New Living Translation, the Bible says, as he traveled through Galilee, Galilee he came to Cana, where he had turned the water into wine. That's a whole other revelation. There was a government official in nearby Capernaum whose son was very sick. Now, that's the setup. The government official comes to him, and he says, Jesus, watch this, come to my house. My son is sick. So the thought is, in order for him to be healed, I need him to come to my house. If he comes to my house, he will lay hands on my son, and my son will be healed. Jesus says, man, y'all need me to do miracles for you to believe in me? The man says, Jesus, please, my son is about to die. Please come with me. Now, what you will discover is this journey, in order for him to get to where Jesus was and where he was formerly, it takes hours to walk that. Some would have taken about 12 hours to get from one point to the other walking, right? So can you imagine for 12 hours he's walking, trying to get to Jesus, which most likely says he had tried other things. He gets to Jesus after hearing about his miraculous power. He says to him, would you please, would you please heal my son? He says, come to my house. Jesus says to him, you know what? Your son is healed now. Now wait a minute. I thought... You had to leave where we are, walk 12 hours with me. YPJ, 
and 12 hours, my son would be whole, but the cre reality is, 12 hours, he could die. Jesus knew they didn't have 12 hours. So Jesus said, you don't need me to physically go, you just need me to speak the word. Because the word travels faster than any car. It travels faster than any jet. It travels, come on, speed of sound. It travels. The moment Jesus said, your son is healed, the Bible says the man believed. It didn't say he fought with Jesus. He said, no, come on, Jesus, just, can you just please just, oh, I hear you, but can you just, he said, okay, wait a second. You telling me that all I had to do is believe you? He said, yeah, that's it. Your son is healed. The Bible says he believed and turned away and walked away from Jesus, which meant he let go of what he thought Jesus should do and receive what Jesus wanted to see. A lot of y'all can't get your blessing because you won't let go of what you think Jesus should do. And you need to accept that once he says it, that settles it. He's walking. Y'all got to get a hold of this. He's walking 12 hours home. Can you imagine what's going through his head? He's excited. Why is he excited? Because it said he believed. He wasn't 12 hours, Brother Terrence, going, I don't know. If God. He said he believed. I believe he turned a 12-hour journey into about six hours. My son's going to make it because Jesus said he's going to make it. But what he didn't know was one of the servants was running in the same direction that he was coming this way. They was going that way. Because the moment Jesus said he's healed, the boy was coughing and he just went... Ma, huh? I'm not sick no more. The servant said, go, to, go tell the master. He running. The master running. He sees the servant running over the top of the hill. He says, wait a minute, that's my servant. He said, master, master, huh, huh, your son. What about him? He's completely healed. He said, wait, wait, wait. When did it happen? He said, like around 1 o'clock. He said, wait a minute, I met Jesus at 1 o'clock. So you telling me that the moment he said it, it didn't take 30 seconds, 40 seconds, a minute, two hours, three hours. My son went from sick to whole in less than a second's time because he spoke the word. All right. The Bible says he believed. Now, this is the part that's powerful. He remembered what Jesus said, but the last line said, and he and his entire household believed in Jesus. Now, there's two things I want to bring out and I'm done. He and his entire household believed in Jesus. Was anybody in the household with Jesus? No, just him. They never met Jesus. The way they believed in Jesus was not by meeting Jesus personally. They met Jesus through his testimony, which meant that what had happened in his life was so powerful, he used his words to convince them to believe. Ladies and gentlemen, the Bible didn't say some of the people in his house believe. It said everybody in his house believe. Because he said, now listen, you can play with me if you want to, but you know this boy was sick when I left. So what did he do? He just simply told me my son was healed. And then what did you do? Did you have to give an offering? No. Did you have to dance and run around in a circle 20 times? No. Did you have to, did you have to sit with him and have dinner? No. So what did, he, what did he ask you to do? He technically didn't ask me to do anything. I just chose to believe. I got a real church today. Some of y'all broke right now because you refuse to believe. But when I say to you that this is your year of abundance, I wish I had 40 people that would say, I don't care what they believe, Pastor. I believe. There are some of you that are sick right now because when we tell you the healer is in the room, you think he's going to heal everybody but me. Nah, baby. I declare I am healed and I am whole right now because if God said it, I believe. He said, and his entire household believed in Jesus. But the second thing I want you to bring out, and I want you to consider it in this, this time of thinking, is the fact that the boy didn't know what was going on. He was just sick. He was, in, listen, y'all, he's sick. Can you imagine him laying there, sick? And they said he's about to die. So he has something that was terminal. He's dying. Can you imagine the family that's rubbing and petting his head saying, it's okay, we love you. And he knows it's over, I'm about to die. And then just all of a sudden, all his strength 
his organs, his kidneys, his lungs, everything just starts working again. He's able to breathe again. All his strength comes back. And he's sitting here going, what is, wait a second. This is the boy. I was just super sick. And now I am completely well. What happened? This boy was perplexed, I guarantee you, for hours. His mother, perplexed for hours. The servants, perplexed for hours. Everybody like, what is going on? And little do they know whoo, that while he was sick, there were two people having a conversation. Y'all not going to help me in this place. Two people that they were unaware of were having a conversation that was about to change everybody's life. I know y'all don't like old school, but aren't you glad somebody was praying for you? When you didn't even know they were praying for you, when you were smoking everything, drinking everything, laying with everybody, having a good time, and God was setting you free because there was a conversation happening with heaven that you didn't even know about. You better stop this attitude of prayer don't work. Your son is out of control. Get out of that bed at five in the morning. Throw your hands in the air and say, the devil is a liar. I will not lose my child to drugs. I will not lose my daughter to an abusive relationship. I will not lose, oh, come on and talk to me in this place it is a war of words it's a war of words it's directly impacting us because when I tell y'all that your words matter you don't want to hear me but I hear the Lord saying today get your words up get your words up there is enough of you speaking negative and when people start speaking negative to you you need to rebuttal them and say hey 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 get your words up what do you mean oh this is gonna be the worst year it's gonna be a hard year uh uh get your words up that ain't what pastor ypj said he said it's gonna be a hard year for the world but we are the righteous and this is gonna be a year of abundance for us oh i don't know they said the economy uh uh, uh. get your words up we don't live by this earthly economy the bible says my god shall supply all of my need according to his riches and glory I don't know. It's going to be a bad year, ladies and gentlemen. Sometimes you got to look back and say, do you remember we were just in a pandemic in 2020 and they said we was going to lose everything? Baby, I got a new car, a new house, and more joy. If God blessed me in a famine back then, there will be favor in a famine again. I'm not going to let you pull me down. I wish I had a better praiser than that because patty cake ain't going to do it in 2024. God is looking for a radical group of believers that will speak the word of God and say, as for me and my house, we are going to prosper. Where's that household at? Where's that household at that declares that there's mail coming that you didn't even know was coming? There's all opportunity coming that you didn't even know was coming. That there's somebody going to be saved this year that you've been praying for and you didn't even know what's going to happen. Because this is a war of words in the way that we war. The way that we war is by praising the Lord with our words and coming into agreement with what he said. And if he said it, that settles it. I'm hollering and I'm sorry. Oh, man, we got to go, but I feel the Holy Ghost in here. Uh, that's just part one. We'll get to part two next week, but can we just take a praise break for a minute and somebody use your words as your weapon and begin to declare the atmosphere? At some point, Michael started fighting with the devil, and he said, uh-uh, we ain't using no swords and no spears. Satan, the Lord, rebuke you. I got the weapon that will pull you down. The enemy was cast down by the word. I don't know if I believe that. To me, I don't know if I believe that because you're telling me that Michael used the word to cast the devil out. What did Jesus use to cast out demons? All right, listen, listen, listen. Jesus is talking to the devil and the devil is in his face. The Bible doesn't say the devil was in his face, sort of, because when Jesus got sick of looking at him, he made a statement. He said, get thee behind me he used his words and the enemy had to respond by repositioning himself the bible says resist the devil and he will flee from you he has to reposition how do we resist him with our words because what is he using to fight us words he's the accuser of the brethren the devil can't slap you don't you think if he could slap you he would have slapped you Even when he wanted to attack Job, the Bible said he had to go to God and ask permission. He said, I want to touch him, but you won't let me. And it wasn't until God said, all right, you can do this and this, but you can't do that. He was able to make movement. But see, when Jesus died, all of that stopped. Y'all didn't hear what I just said. Because you and now joint heirs with Jesus Christ. We're not just mere humans. We're new creatures. 
We're new creations. Therefore, when the enemy goes to heaven on your behalf, because he's always up there. Some of you, I got the devil under my feet. You don't. He's up there fighting because you don't know how to pull him down. And he's up there saying, you know what? I'm going to take everything from you. God, let me take everything. And the Lord says, you can only do that if they let you. Because I've given them power. And the power that they got gives them the right to tell you to get up out of there. How do I do that? With my words. Please listen to me, ladies and gentlemen. You have got to be very careful what you say in this season. Talk to your spouse, talk to your neighbor, talk to somebody, say, we got to get our words up. We got to get our words. I was having a conversation with an individual that I love very, very much, and they were talking about an ailment that they were dealing with, and this was a while back. This was a while back. The ailment that they were dealing with was something that I had dealt with before, but I was already healed from it. But for whatever reason, I started talking about the situation like I had it still, almost like in a relatable conversation. I was like, oh, yeah, I know all about that because this, 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 and this. But I was talking like I had it, but I don't have it no more. I'm not playing with y'all. As soon as I hung the phone up, the symptoms start coming back. I said, oh, no, I don't got that. I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. I'm, I'm so, I would never lie to y'all. I am so serious. Immediately, the symptoms started coming back. I said, wait a minute, this thing is real. I said, Father, forgive me for being carnal in my conversation for the sake of relatability. Like some of y'all used to be broke, and when broke people start talking, you almost feel guilty, so you feel like you got to start talking broke with them. Child, I know it is hard in this economy. Now you finna be broke. Because you lost the war of words. You got to testify, not agree. I'm going through financially. Man, I know how that felt. So I remember when I was there. Now let me encourage you. The same God that brought me out is the same God that can bring you out. But you got to get your words up. Giving at Faith Alive is very easy. You can give by using the Givelify app. Just look up Faith Apostolic Ministries in South Bend, Indiana, or scan the QR code on the screen. You can give with the Cash App. Send your gift to dollar sign FAM Center. You can also give by going to our website, faithalivenow.com. Scroll down and click on the donate button, and you will be able to use PayPal, a debit card, or a credit card to give your financial gift. <laughs> Lastly, if you prefer, you can mail your gift to Faith Alive Ministries, 935 North Bendix Drive, South Bend, Indiana, 46628. We appreciate all of you who give to this ministry. We pray God's blessings upon you and your household. Tell by the music, bro. Can't you tell by the love you felt before you took one step through the door? And that next level teaching got us reaching higher every week. Frequent flyers speaking life despite deceased and viral. Meant to be in because he's inside. It's not a private party, you're invited. Come in tired, believe inspired. All generations eat in cyber. Find us on the web like these some spiders. Uh, let's slow it down so you understand how it's going down. Up in here, there's one rule. Gotta love everybody that comes through. Then doors, in short. Grace is what we endorse. Faith is what we help grow. Welcome to the fam, Sim.